But let me open in prayer and then I'll tell you what's been on my mind and check in with each of you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and give you the praise for all that's happening in the earth at this time. Lord, I thank you for the rain. I thank you for you bringing growth and life to those who believe in you. Lord, we put our trust in you. We rest in you. Your joy is our strength. And I thank you, Lord, that despite the darkness, your joy and your peace can still be evident in your people, should be evident in your people. It's our strength. It's our power. It's our victory. It's the light that shines in the darkness. So, Lord, we ask for those things to increase in your body. And I pray that you would use this time to strengthen us, equip us, enlighten us, make us aware, discerning, and wise for how you want us to move in the days ahead. And we give you this time, all the thanks, all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Years ago, when I was teaching a class on uh, training lay counselors, and Val was there, um, I'm not sure who else was in this round, but we were meeting at the University of Maine at Presque Isle. And I remember one day, there, there are moments in time that the Lord, when he gives me prophetic revelation, they just get seared in my mind, where I was, what I was doing. And it was in one of these classes, and I looked out the window into the parking lot at the university, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, there is a spirit of fear that's about to be released across the earth. And it will grow in intensity, and people will be panicking. And so when you talk about, you know, we used to take risks every day. Everything we do is a risk. I could burn myself on the stove. I could slip and fall in the shower and get a concussion. That's living under a spirit of fear. And like you said, what is coming at us in a barrage in our face and our eyes every day right now is fear, fear, fear. There's a spirit behind that um, that's based in science. Uh, it's not that the science is wrong. It's look for the spirit that's behind it is it building you up in your spirit man is it bringing you life encouragement or is it making you rethink everything and be afraid because we're still taking risks every day uh, and the strategy because you said does this mean we're going to be taken out are we going to die the fact is people die every year from a number of issues and so when Satan tries to attack me through fear or give me those thoughts. This is the strategy I've learned. You can do with it what you want is I just declare that nothing is taking me out until God's plans and purposes are fulfilled in my life and that I will walk out the entirety of God's ordained days for my life and nothing will take me out. Um, and that just tells the enemy and you say it out loud. Because that fear tries to press in. It tries to get in. Uh, literally, I can feel when the spirit tries. It's like it sits on my chest and it wants to push in. And I have to speak words of life against it. Because once it gets in, it's really hard to get out. Once it takes up residence in your mind and your soul, fear is very hard to get out when it's a spirit of fear. So always remember, God's got a plan and a purpose for your life and that every one of us are going to die someday. And none of us knows how we're going to die, when or where, but I ain't going nowhere until God says my time's up. And Satan's a liar and a thief. I'm not going to agree with him. So much going on that when we don't meet fairly regularly, it's hard to catch people up when people say, well, what's been going on with you? Uh, where do you start with everything that's been unfolding? So that's why it's so critical to stay in contact with others as much as possible. Uh, there are some things as the Lord gives revelation and speaks that I'm thinking, oh yeah, I've got to remember to tell somebody that. Uh, it's important that we get this out. But then if you're not talking to anybody, it's hard. So when I woke up uh, the other day, I was thinking, can I really squeeze in a meeting? But I felt it was important. Uh, there are a couple of things <clears throat> that I felt the Lord wanted me to share with you. And 
I don't know how well it flows. I'll just talk here in our time that's left. And you all touched on it a little bit in different ways. But one thing I'm noticing that seems to be missing a lot in society right now is critical thinking skills. Rational, logical, objective thought, where you're not afraid to look at all sides of an issue. And when I wrote down, what is the definition of critical thinking? It's considered the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment or conclusion. So it's to be objective and rational and al analyze and evaluate whatever the issue is so you can form your own judgments or conclusions. And we may or we may not agree. The Bible, what do you think the Bible refers to this as? Critical thinking. What would a biblical term be that corresponds with critical thinking? And there's a couple. Is right. it sound? Is that one? I have a sound mind. Yes, that would be a good one. Can you think of anything else? Any other terms where you believe the Bible exhorts us to engage in critical thinking? When you said that, I thought of the mind of Christ. The mind take every, of Christ. Take every thought captive. Yep. Take thoughts captive. To the obedience of Christ. Wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And is it wisdom and knowledge from the world? No. no. <laughs> um, the two, and I didn't come up with any of those, but the two that jumped out to me were we're exhorted multiple times throughout scripture to pray for discernment and to be discerning and to discern the times and the seasons mm -hmm. and to discern what is the will of God. And discernment is another word for judgment. So there's a righteous judgment and judging all things with a righteous judgment. So judgment and discernment would be two other concepts big, biblically that speak to critical thinking. And all of those things, those scriptures you've referenced support the fact that God wants us. The word ponder is used throughout scripture. We're to ponder things and, and search the scriptures and see how things line up with scripture. Now, going back to secular, uh, when I did my graduate studies, there was a class I had to take that I absolutely hated. And I've taken more than one in my college history on research and types of research and how research is done in the scientific community. And there are two primary forms of research. Does anybody know what those two primary forms are? There are various types of research, but two primary forms. There is quantitative research and qualitative research. Both are valid, but they have different functions and they operate differently. And I want to just put this out here because we're, we're hearing so much today, not, not only about COVID, but COVID's the hot topic for the last year and a half or more. <clears throat> oh, following the science. Well, science, when it's quantitative, it's when you take different, uh, it's a collection and evaluation of data and facts. It's very analytical, objective, concrete. And you analyze and evaluate that data for purposes of understanding. It's based in numbers a lot and facts. And when you evaluate it, then you can infer uh, what it did in the past, the present, and what it might do in the future. This method is used to make hypotheses and measurable conclusions. Quantitative research answers the question, what happened? So when we're seeing all these graphs and charts and it's measuring how many COVID cases in this month and how many this month, what happened? It's got numbers. People might argue that the data is flawed. 
what I have learned about quantitative research is that you can make numbers say anything you want them to say. Yeah. And anybody can take the same data and reach very different conclusions based on their narrative and their perspective. That's very important when we're listening, not only to the scientific community, <clears throat> but when we're listening to theologians and teachers of anything. I want to know who I'm listening to. I want to know what their agenda is. I want to know what they're trying to sell me. And I want to be able to sit and do some critical thinking with the information that was just presented to me. I don't want to just embrace it fully as the gospel. Those of you who've been around this ministry for years have heard me say multiple times when I teach, this is not the gospel according to Nancy. Go take your Bible and do your homework to see if what I said was biblically sound or not. People who teach critical thinking skills are not afraid of being questioned. The second type of research is called qualitative research. And this type of research seeks not to figure out what happened, but it wants to know why it happened. This is my preferred method of research. I appreciate quantitative and numbers and rational data, but again, I also know it can be skewed to say anything anybody wants it to say. Qualitative data says, I don't, I don't really know, want to know what happened, but why did it happen? This method assumes that reality is always changing and variables can be hard to measure with numbers. And so this method collects data through observation and interviews. And it predicts outcomes by using information that's been collected through interviews, surveys, and participant observations. It's more subjective, but it's still effective and can be very accurate. So when I talk to X number of people and I'm hearing a pattern and I have to know whether it's a regional or localized or is this national or global that I'm hearing this, that's how I make conclusions. I will also look at the quantitative numbers, but if you're going to do biblical critical thinking, it's important that you use, ask both these questions. What has happened? Why has it happened? and then ponder and do your own research and, and question what you're reading. Um, why do we need to question and why do we need to engage in critical thinking according to the Bible? I was, it, it's the sons of Issachar, they knew the times. Okay. They knew, knew what was going on around them. They were accurate in seeing what was actually going on around them. Okay, they were accurate. But why? Why do we need to be sons of Issachar? Why do we need to engage in critical thinking? Why do we need to know? Well, you're moving from a foundation of what's true. What's the warning in the New Testament to the church? Be prepared. Repeated. E Even the uh, elect deceived. could be de deceived. Exactly. Repeated warnings that the church is going to be deceived and that deception is going to infiltrate the church and yeah. wolves are coming in among the flock to deceive. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Yeah. You need to know how to critically think. Mm -hmm. And don't just say, God told me this. You've got to be able to support it. And if you're going to use empirical data and quantitative measurements, then support that with scripture. When people talk about the vaccine, and this is just one issue of many, I don't, I don't want to make it about the vaccine. I also don't want you to think that I'm hiding anything. I told you my mom and I had COVID. I am not vaccinated. My mother is. We both got COVID at the same time. We both had similar uh, responses, just a few different symptoms. Knocked us down for about the same amount of time. And when people want to talk to me about why I didn't get vaccinated, it's very simple to me. God didn't release me to do it. I don't care what the numbers say. I inquired of the Lord. Um, I have loved ones and friends who are vaccinated. 
that's great. They inquired of the Lord too. Mm -hmm. I'm not judging them. I can only know what the Lord told me to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why you've also heard for years, part of the teaching of this ministry has been learn to hear the voice of the Lord for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to know how to hear his voice. And if you can't hear it, then get around somebody who can. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think they're hearing the Lord's voice, but they will have a fruit and a trail of whether what they've heard has been accurate or not. It's going to be critical moving forward that you learn to think critically, but you also know how to discern the voice of the Lord for yourself. Does somebody who has their Bible in front of them or can look it up on their phone quickly, would you read Ephesians 5, 6 through 10? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were form formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. That's our charge for the days ahead. Don't be deserved, de deceived and learn what is pleasing to the Lord, righteousness and holiness and truth. Walk in those things in the days ahead. Um, could somebody read 1 John 4, 1, please? Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. Test everything. Test everything because the false prophets and the false teachers are going to grow as we move toward the end of the age, the number yeah. of them, and their voices are going to be very loud. And we're already hearing this both in the secular and the church. Mm -hmm. Last one, I had a lot of scriptures, but we're only going to do these three. Could somebody read Romans 12, 2, please? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Feed your white dog. For those of you who know about the white dog and the black dog, starve your black dog. The black dog contains torment, fear, despair, hopelessness. Mm. Feed that white dog. Get in the word. Read Christian writings. Um, inquire of the Lord every day. Encourage him. Like I said, the Lord hides things for her to find. Ask the Lord to show you things throughout your day and to speak to you throughout your day. Mm -hmm. He'll do it. He just wants to know you're interested and you're going to engage in the hide and seek game with him. He loves to play hide and seek with his kids. Mm -hmm. Did you see this, Nancy? Did you catch that? And I can look at anybody's data or hear them teach or hear a great sermon, but I want to know who this person is and what their agenda is and what do I know about their spirit and their fruit. Uh, yeah. Some of you have heard me share that when I was in grad school, I had a classmate, you know, these are in intelligent people for the most part you know not everybody who's educated is intelligent but um this guy said i just came from this class on gender studies and the book that we're using this author do you realize that there is no such thing as gender and we only think there is because we see breasts or we see a penis uh and that's in our mind we've determined that means gender but gender does not exist and everybody was embracing that i mean we're talking two decades ago and I spoke up and I said anybody can write anything in a book do you know who you're reading do you know who his agenda what his agenda is um I could give you other books that say just the, the opposite I could put a bible in your hand where it says God made male and female he created them in his image so which author is right know what you're reading and test the spirit behind it Mm -hmm. and for the record back then i don't know if anybody remembers me saying this one either we are moving toward a genderless society i said that a long time ago when they started out with genderless clothing 
unisex clothing when in college they're putting out gender studies about there is no such thing as gender. Um, we are reaping what we've been teaching as yeah. a nation, our nations. I read an article the other day, and I want you to know that when I mention these publications, I don't follow any of these. They're just titles that show up on my newsfeed on my phone. And if I'm sitting somewhere, and I got time to burn, I'll read an article that catches my attention. And I read this article the other day from, I don't remember what it's from. Oh, in the Washington Post. <laughs> don't judge me for that. Um, and it was an article about how we can tell what's real or fake. And I don't know if anybody read it, but I'm gonna read you a couple excerpts of it. And the Lord just spoke to me so powerfully through this article. And it was an article written by a, a, a renowned and respected photographer or photojournalist by the name of Jonas Bendixson. And he's written this new book called the book of, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Veles, V-E-L-E-S. And in his book, he's asking us to consider how we know whether something is true and real or fake and a lie. And most importantly, do we care? Do we really care if something is fake as long as it supports our view? And he made the focus of his book on this town of Veles, Macedonia. And in this book, the thing about this book is it's a fabrication. The entire book is fake. And interestingly enough, he did it intentionally to prove a point that has become incredibly urgent to the world right now. He used artificial intelligence along with YouTube and internet research to help him create fake people doing fake things that he could insert into photos from this town in Macedonia. It is a fascinating and terrifying book to read. And it said, but it's not surprising. All of us have been hearing about deep fake videos for quite a while now and fake news. We know that his book about Veles is fake only because he's told us it is. But his effort proved embarrassingly effective. He took it to a, I can't find it right here, big photojournalist conference internationally. And everybody that saw it, read it and bought it and said, oh yeah, this is in his style. And uh, they thought it was a great book. And he goes on, uh, the premise says, there have always been fakers in the news business. The world is full of people who let their desires and ambitions lead them into lies and fakery. It's unfortunate, but it's true. It happens in the church too, <clears throat> not just the world. We don't have to look very far or even all that hard to find instances of fabrication and photoshopping in the news. Fakery is gripping our national political conversations in both the United States and Canada. It's always been around, but it has really amped up in the last few years. If a narrative or perspective doesn't fit into some neat little preconceived idea, then we just label it fake news. And we all know that fake news, that phrase started coming out in 2016 in the US uh, presidential elections. We kept hearing fake news, fake news. And so if we hear something we don't like, we call it fake news. I see it on social media when I'm reading about people talking about COVID and vaccinations. If somebody doesn't agree, they'll just say that's fake news. But interestingly, this book was all about the manufacturing of fake news. And it says this explosion of fake news has been largely fueled by our continual use of social media. Now, it says social media has become almost indispensable to our lives over the last few years, from finding lost connections, old friends, to researching buying cars. It's all possible on social media. Social media even promises us that we could get rich if we can get enough followers or generate enough traffic to our sites. I will let you know that I got on social media on Facebook specifically in the last year 
for when COVID hit is when I started. And I kept my profile private and don't accept friend requests for the most part. There was a bunch piling up and I just went through and clicked, accept them all. But I don't interact, I don't put anything of my personal stuff up there. And I'm really trying to juggle the, this is a platform where you can get the gospel across the world and biblical truths. You can, people that can access and ask questions to the point that this is really annoying. And like I said, it infuriates me looking at the judgmental spirit of religion, fake prison profile presentations that I see people put up there. And at least regionally and locally, and sometimes beyond that, even nationally, because I know what I know about things and situations and because of my age and I've been around the block, I know the facts behind some of these profiles and what they post is not who they are when you know them privately. Very, very disturbing to me. Um, yeah. Fake person. So I continually debate, oh, I have this that the Lord showed me. Should I post this? Or then I go to the other side of, this is so annoying. I don't even want to look at this or use it. That's a battle I'm waging with the Lord. Uh, what am I supposed to do with this? Do you want me off it? I haven't got an answer yet. But he said this promise that social media holds to us, it was this last little bit of seduction that you could get rich if you get enough followers and traffic and be an influencer. It's that little bit of seduction that took a fairly obscure town in Macedonia and turned it into an epicenter for fake news. That's because this town of Velas in Macedonia, in the center of the country, was once a prosperous city, but after its industries failed, it became a city racked by poverty. It, it just had an economic decline. But creating fake news sites that capitalized on the 2016 presidential race gave many people in that town who were mostly teenagers a way to pull themselves out of poverty. And so this author, Bendixson, wanted to investigate this little town and how it had turned the manufacture of fake news into profit. So he set out for North Macedonia and what he found reinforced what he'd always already read that people are being duped with fake news and it's coming from very credible sounding places. Mm -hmm. um, he said the largest single source of income for this town of 60,000 people is coming from its thriving fake news industry. It's one of the main sources of income for the people of Bellis because poverty breeds a sense of helplessness. And when you feel helpless, we are all prone to doing all kinds of things we never would have thought possible, including lie, cheat, or steal. Most everybody said here, I have food to eat. I have a roof over my head. Don't assume that you're gonna be this righteous paragon of virtue when you have no food to eat. <laughs> and you're watching family members starve. A very quick change in your circumstances will quickly show who you are yeah. and what fear will do to you or desperation. So by creating this book of photojournalism, he asked us some very tough and necessary questions. And if he can make a book that his own colleagues and some of the biggest titans in the field believed, how secure can we feel when we are trying to determine the truth? especially when we're reading it online. Hmm. The scariest question his work brings up is whether we really care. Does the truth matter? Should we question those who we believe have the right credentials? So what if somebody's a seminary graduate and they've written all these theological books and they are a renowned pastor, do we not question them? 
same with a college professor or a physician or doctor or the CDC, do we not question them? Test everything. One thing is certain, when and if fakery becomes the norm in society, you won't be able to say the warning signs weren't there. And Bendixson is far from the per first person who's trying to raise the alarm. And when I, that's the end of this article, when I read this, this is why we need discernment, spiritual discernment, and you need to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. Now, I'm going to say something that's probably going to tick a lot of people off. Uh, maybe not, uh, as I think about who's on here, but might. People could label me a conspiracy theorist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just listen to what God tells me. Some of what God tells me lines up with what conspiracy theorists are saying. And all I know is that what he's told at me, he's been faithful and true to fulfill. And I'm expecting he's going to fulfill the rest of what he's told me. Having said that, I'm not a QAnon follower and, and similar groups. But uh, some of those folks are accurate in some of the things they're seeing. But what I want to urge you when I hear Oh, you should see the videos we've seen. You can't unsee what you've seen uh, about all these horrific things that are being done by heads of state and especially being done to children. I'm not saying that these things aren't happening. I know these things are happening. You want to be really, really careful what you're saying with your mouth that is accusing somebody specifically in leadership or even a resident in your town about engaging in horrific ungodly behaviors because of something you saw or read online. I'm urging you, that's a prophetic word for right now. Be very careful what you're saying about people. Number one, it's gossip. You don't know it. I don't care what you think you saw Hillary Clinton doing or Barack Obama. I don't care. You don't know if that's true. Th this tells you that there are people out there engaged in fakery. You can create videos of anything and put anybody's face on it. Mm -hmm. If they, these videos that people have told me about are in fact real, then they will burn in hell and stand before a righteous God and he'll deal with them. But do I know what goes on behind the closed doors of Donald Trump's house or Hillary Clinton's? No. And so I'm not going to be on social media or in my ministry settings denouncing people by name because of things that I saw or heard. If you, there's a quote, if you didn't see it with your own eyes and hear it within your own ears, <clears throat> then don't spread it with your big mouth. <laughs> That's words of wisdom for the days ahead. The reason I say that is this is what God's pushing the church toward right now. Holiness, integrity, truth. Yeah. Do not let any cat. Uh, what's the scripture says? We're all going to give an account for every careless word that we've spoken. As we're moving ahead, God's tolerance for these types of behavior is getting shorter and shorter. There, you will answer for the careless words, especially about other people and accusations. Um, in light of that, the next question is how should the church respond? But before I go there very quickly, I wanna tell you about what's happening in the church currently and then leave you with some prophetic insights and then have people Please, uh, at any point, post prayer requests in the chat so we can know how to be praying for you as well. But does anybody have any questions about this when I say this? I do think over here we've got people believing things that aren't true and they're information hounds and trying to gather all this information, which is a sin. If you don't know, then don't spread all that. But on the other side of the pendulum is the sin where people are naive and have their heads in the sand and don't want to look at it and don't want to believe it's happening. There's some really horrific things happening 
especially to our children. And that gets me so mad. <laughs> Don't be naive with your head in the sand because that's a sin too. And you're going to answer for that. Again, inquire of the Lord. What are you supposed to be doing? Where are you supposed to be? You know, saying, hey, God's got me right where I'm supposed to be right now. He knows that he's where he's supposed to be. We all need to know that we're where we're supposed to be doing what we're supposed to do. Doesn't mean life's all cheery and we don't have some issues, but get yourself positioned for where you're supposed to be right now. And you mentioned about being this road on this road with the ditch. In several of my prophetic dreams over the years, I was driving on a road and my prayer was, God, help me not to go off the road. Keep me right in the center of this road. And all hell was breaking loose around and the road was rumbling and roiling, but he is able to keep us centered. But in Ecclesiastes says two are better than one. Yeah. Uh, and a three chord strand cannot easily be broken. You've got to have people around you that you are engaged with on a regular basis. And I have people who are asking me, a number of people are saying they're struggling with certain strongholds or sin issues and I've had a lot of people say, well, I'm better than I was. I'm doing better than I was, but it's still impacting their lives in a negative way. And so my question is, where are your support people? Where's your accountability team? Where are the people you're interacting with? And not just being in a polite Bible study or sitting in a church with where nobody really knows what's going on in your life. Where are the people that can speak a, a tough word to you because they love you? Get around those folks and hang on to them for dear life moving forward. We say media is short for the medium. Medium is a channel by which we get information. When you teach, there's a channel and media is the channel. And you need to know the spirit behind the channel. Um, just like you wouldn't watch some channels on your TV. And if I, I could throw this out do you believe that in North America, the media is being controlled by the hordes of hell and Satan's kingdom or God's kingdom, our mainstream media? And if you go to scripture and look, Satan has been called the prince of the power of the air. The airwaves belong to him. That's his area of authority. He's the prince of the power of the air. It's what's called the second heaven. And the th that's why the things that we say carry so much spiritual weight. Because anything you say is heard by the prince of the power of the air. And it carries on the airwaves. So you're either releasing words of life and hope and encouragement or not. But, and I agree what, I agree fully with what um, Dan was saying, but I just lost my thought like Dan. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, oh, when you said about tearing down ministries, it is what I'm seeing happen in Christian circles is Satan has plants in the Christian community as well. And there are people in leadership that God never called there. And they're there for all kinds of other reasons. But God's word never returns void. So, I mean, if they're preaching the gospel, the gospel will still do its work. But if leadership is sinful or corrupt, that will get revealed. That's why you need to be able to ask questions if something doesn't seem right. Because what happens in these cases and what I end up dealing with is people get very confused because they know something's not right, but they don't want to question this man or woman of God in this church. <clears throat> That's why we gotta be careful about gossiping and tearing down, but the Bible does say test all things. Mm -hmm. And if your spirit doesn't feel comfortable, there's probably a reason. And there's a way to address concerns if you're in a setting or with a church or ministry where you have concerns about leadership or what's being taught. There's a way to address that that's biblical, but don't just engage in the tearing down and slandering, especially in a public platform that's not going to go well when we stand before the Lord. Um, this second article, and I'll go through this quickly, was from The Atlantic. And the article is called, My Church Doesn't Know What to Do Anymore. 
and it's written by a woman by the name of Elizabeth, and she's the rector of St. David's Episcopal Church in Virginia. And this is just some of the excerpts that she wrote. And she said, leading a church is harder now in 2021 than it was in 2020 during the worst of the pandemic. Last year, mandates meant I could just throw up my hands as a church leader and respond, sorry, it's not up to me. And the answer was for the most part, a straightforward no. No, we can't gather for services and no, we can't sing. But now it's up to me as the church leader and I'm struggling to find a way forward for my church. Like so many other communities, we closed to in-person worship in mid-March of 2020. We were able to reopen in a limited way in July, but singing wasn't allowed. And every other pew, as well as prayer books and hymnals had been removed from the church. Masks and reservations were required to attend services. Seating charts had to enforce social distancing. We couldn't pass the offering plate and people in Ghostbuster-like get-ups would sanitize all the seats between services. We were compelled to close again in December of 2020 because of rising case numbers in our county. And we were able to reopen on Palm Sunday of this year, 2021. We live streamed on Sundays. We set up times when people could come pick up their factory sealed sacraments for communion without ever having to get out of their car. We put on drive through events for kids. We provided Sunday school videos. Kids created virtual stations of the cross they drew and made Lego scenes of or enacted with these stations. Photos that we collected and we'd post on Facebook during Holy Week. <clears throat> Funerals and weddings were canceled, postponed, or held with very limited numbers of attendees. All receptions were canceled. I could not perform the last rites of praying and anointing with oil for a dear man who died from COVID. Instead, I could just text his family at the end. His wife responded, he loved you. Eventually all the mandates were lifted except for the prohibition on our common communion cup. By that time, most of the adults in our congregation had been vaccinated, but kids under 12 still couldn't be. We put all the chairs back, we opened the windows and we made masks mandatory for unvaccinated people and we encouraged them for everyone else. We started to allow a little singing in the church with masks, but we had to shorten the songs to keep the services brief. My service sermons were cut back to 1000 words or less. For those who were uncomfortable with this, we created a separate seating area in the church hall where masks were required singing was prohibited and people could watch the live stream sermon projected on a wall. Some families tried that, especially those with young kids and it worked for a couple of weeks. And then they started asking, why don't you make the people who don't wanna wear masks come sit here instead? Because if I'm just gonna come to church to sit and watch it live streamed on a wall, I might as well stay home. I don't know how to make this work as a church leader. After a year of trying to assure people that we were still the church, even if we weren't in the same room, I don't know how to convince them of the importance of gathering in person. I know that if they're gonna sit home and watch, there are a lot fancier churches all over the country offering much slicker streamed services than our little church with its secondhand camera and duct tape tripod. <laughs> and no matter what we do, it isn't going to work for some of the people. Few families have started attending larger churches that have less restrictive policies. I also know that kids' sports, which are held outdoors, have fewer restrictions than we do. And that returning to a church after 20 months away is getting harder with each passing Sunday. In 2020, nobody could come to church. But now some believers are choosing not to. I can see on social media that many of them are at restaurants or parties, but I don't see them in person on Sunday mornings anymore. The pandemic has accelerated trends that I've heard about at church conferences in years past, that Sunday attendance is going to shrink. So churches need to focus on the people outside the walls. Although membership in our church continued to rise until 2020, attendance has been declining since 2014. Interesting, membership is going up, attendance is going down. Hmm. 
This year, we're averaging 66 people on a Sunday whenever we're open. Before we shut down, our average attendance was 139. Nobody has complained about the short sermons, but some people are wishing we'd cut more music instead of the Bible readings. And when people complain, they add, but we know you have to do this. But I don't have to in 2021. I'm trying to follow guidance, but the only actual mandate now remaining is on our, community, our common communion cup. I can't imagine the drama that will unfold when it's permissible again. Does this mean 2022 will be even harder than 2020 and 2021? Our donations were down last year. I'm wincing as I think about this year's funding campaigns. In 2020, our church received a paid check protection program loan that helped us with payroll, but my hours have had to be cut. Of course, this is more than more, this is about more than the finances of our church. The people who are not coming to church aren't clients or subscribers or colleagues, they're parishioners. They're part of the church. I've held their hands as they cried after telling me their secrets or while they're grieving, but not lately because we can't touch. I've pressed home baked bread into their hands, but not lately because we're having to use factory sealed crackers and juice. I've hugged their children. I've drenched the adults and the kids in the waters of baptism. But the last time I baptized someone was in January of 2020. Colleagues just tell me to put my faith in Jesus. But that makes me feel horrible as I'm trying to find solutions to help us thrive as a body of believers. I'm sick of innovating and pivoting and wondering if I'm struggling because my faith isn't strong enough. When others tell me that 47 people have joined their church since the beginning of the pandemic, expletives start dancing in my head. <laughs> Historically, our church has been known for embracing the middle ground. The church that I've served for 10 years, the Episcopal Church, is a genuinely diverse congregation in terms of belief, socioeconomic class, and political views. We've, we we've weathered the controversies over gay marriage and the political divisions wrought by the 2016 elections. But I worry that we won't be able to make it through the rest of the pandemic with our, different, with our differing risk tolerances and our approaches to masks. I can't find a middle way in these times. That's one church leader's story, and I think it would resonate with many. I have a number of thoughts there. I have compassion and sympathy for some things, <clears throat> but again, you need to be informed to know what agendas the Episcopal Church and doctrines are teaching. And if they are embracing gay marriage, should certain churches be shut down? I don't know, I'm just asking. If, if churches are uh, condoning, promoting, or supporting doctrines, teachings, or practices that go against the Bible, should they be shut down? So what do you think churches should do? We're all sitting here on a Zoom meeting. We all liked gathering together in person. Um, but even if you are still gathering in small groups, that can become very incestuous and sickly if you're not seeing new people coming and going or you're not dividing and growing, multiplying. That's, that's a great commission. That's discipling is multiplying. So what do you think the church should do moving forward? When will, as Val said, these kingdom communities become practical? or necessary. We could say that they're practical now and they're necessary now, but it's like I've told Val, she's wanted to talk about this a few times about kingdom communities. I said, we're so far from kingdom communities. I think God's still separating the wheat and the tares and the chaff. But we'll see who's left standing. And it's hard to watch mm. the exposing and the unveiling. And really, the answer to my question is, I want to know if you, somebody has practical strategies they're doing that they can share with the group. And at the bigger picture, it's to provoke you to do engage in critical thinking. Um, what are you the church? How are you the church responding to this new, I know people don't like the term new normal, but it is what we're living in right now. 
and how do we regain everybody's lonely i mean this is great but there are days i mean the only one on here who's lonely and i met in bangor with the pastor a few weeks ago and i just said i'm lonely for corporate worship and i said it's just it's dry but it's also a season where god's calling us to come into intimacy and for some of us it's a calling back into the level of intimacy where it's just you and him um, so it's being aware of what you're lonely for but also assessing where you're at with the lord so again it's that asking him um, and don't do anything unless he tells you to do it and when i think about doing something and i just don't have a peace or i have this little nagging that I'm not released. It, and like I said earlier, it was about the vaccine. It wasn't, I didn't hear an outright no, but I don't normally hear yes or no. I just look for peace and a sense of release in anything. That's what I tell folks is you can't prepare for everything. So that's why you've got to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. He will tell you exactly what you need to prepare. For some people it's medical supplies, for some people, it's food items. For some people, it's bedding because they're going to be housing folks. Ask the Lord what he wants you to do. For some people, it's to keep in your home, to be prepared. For others, it's to give them away. Um, so just inquire of the Lord and listen to what he's saying. I have had people contacting me and saying, Nancy, uh, I feel like we need to prepare, what should I be getting? People that are random, that haven't come to classes, people at all different levels of socioeconomic status. And one person said, Nancy, would you ever consider doing a class on preparedness? I said, you know, I did a lot of classes on preparedness about 12 to 10 or 12 years ago. I don't feel the need, I don't feel God telling me to do that right now. But if somebody calls me and asks me a direct question, I will answer it for them. Um, I do agree that this is a time of preparedness and the time is short. You can't, like I said, you don't have to go crazy, but like I said, buy as little as you can go, whether it's food or other supplies. Oh, some of the things that I didn't say before, but I think are going to be important are things like detergent, dish soap, shampoos, uh, hand soaps. The number one issue moving forward that I feel the Lord has been speaking is to keep your head down. Do not be arrogant, do not be judgmental, do not be self-righteous, do not be pious. Be careful what you're saying about people. As things get exposed and you see people getting exposed in their sin or secret sin being uncovered, be careful even what you're thinking in your own mind. Be careful how dogmatic you wanna be about issues of the vaccination. Don't, don't take this dogmatic stance because God's really good at making you eat humble pie. Hmm. So learn to be respectful. Do what you believe he's calling you to do. Make sure you're bouncing it off godly counsel and those in your accountability circle because they're your safety. Test everything, but always confer with godly counsel about it. <laughs>